From high snowy mountains to the sun-baked wilderness. Forests, meadows and quiet waters. The Dead Sea and the flowering desert. Animals from Europe, Asia and Africa, where three continents meet. This is the nature of the Holy Land. There has been a trade route down the eastern coast of the Mediterranean since time immemorial, used by Phoenicians, Greeks, Arabs and Romans. The coastal region of the Holy Land has been built on and lived in for thousands of years. Some of the traders went by sea and others by land. All up and down the coast they built towns and fortresses to guard the route. Some have disappeared into the sand and others are still thriving. The wonder is that with so much human activity there's still any wildlife in the area. But there is, and beside it a determination to ensure that it survives. Not only on the coast, but in the forests inland lies a part of modern Israel virtually unknown outside the country. The Romans knew this part of the Mediterranean coast as Via Maris, the Sea Road. When the Romans built the aqueduct to supply the city of Caesarea, this was already a densely inhabited area. In its heyday, the city housed as many as a hundred thousand people. The great amphitheater was built to seat three and a half thousand. A thousand years later, when the Crusaders came, they fortified the town of Acre, now the busy modern port of Akko, much of it still within the old walls. And so it went on down the centuries. Great coastal cities like Tel Aviv and Haifa are carrying on a tradition from the earliest days of history. The human population now is thousands of times greater than it was in historical times, and it continues to grow. The problem facing the modern inhabitants of the cities along the sea road is how to balance their lives with those of the wild creatures around them. Sometimes they don't even seem to be trying. Everywhere new buildings are springing up, and new buildings need new building materials. In some places the ancient dunes are being dug away to provide homes for people, at the same time removing the homes of the animals which have nowhere else to live. This area was once populated by gerbils, lizards, snakes and hedgehogs. Soon it will be just another suburb. But behind the roar of the machinery and the bustle of sand trucks lies a movement to ensure that at least some of the coastal scenery and its wildlife lives on, alongside the growing human population.
Beside the quarry where the tracks of a gazelle tell their own story, a nature reserve of sand and scrub still offers homes to a few survivors of the old times. And above the belching factories and power plants of the coastal cities, the forests of Mount Carmel stand cool and peaceful, ready to receive a welcome new group of immigrants to the Holy Land. <laughs> They're roe deer, bred in captivity from a group imported from France. Their release attracts the eager attention of the press. They're the same species as the deer that lived in these forests throughout history until they were hunted out in the 19th century. Some carry radio collars so that their fate can be followed by the scientists who are releasing them. They're part of a long-term plan to rebuild the ecosystem broken down by long years of human misuse. Some of them seem overcome by the experience of being handled, but they quickly recover and set off into their newfound freedom. Back at the breeding station on the slopes of Mount Carmel, fallow deer are also being reared and prepared for the same liberation into the forest. They're the Mediterranean race, bred from a nucleus that came from Iran. They breed freely here, this is their rut or mating season, and it will soon be time to release some of them. The males are busy deciding the order of seniority among their ranks. The normally placid herd is disturbed by sporadic bursts of calling and fighting. The nursing females will soon be pregnant again with a new generation of deer destined for freedom. Each of the breeding groups has two mature males. Among fallow deer, competition, or jealousy, is the strongest motive for mating. Behind them, the forests await the transformation that the deer will bring. The Mediterranean fallow deer is the rarest subspecies in the world, and Israel now has the largest herd of them. Their presence in the forest was noted by Tristram, the great 19th century naturalist who made a special study of the Holy Land. But soon after he left, the deer were seen no more. Their role in the re-establishment of the forest ecosystem will be, in effect, to carry on where they left off. The clear ground dotted with trees in their enclosure shows what the forest will look like when they are once more living in it. They're nature's pruners, keeping the undergrowth clear and allowing trees to grow, opening up the forest for all kinds of other animals. Some of the pelicans that migrate every year to the Holy Land also come from Iran, as well as from Eastern Europe. In the autumn, they leave their breeding grounds on the shores of the Black Sea and the Caspian, stopping off in Israel on their way to Africa.
They come in their thousands, and their target is the commercial fish ponds that produce a good proportion of Israel's food. They're not entirely welcome. They are charming and elegant, and they move together as if they've been trained by a great choreographer. But they are also very successful fishermen, and at the wrong time of year they can wreak havoc amongst the carefully cultivated fish crop. There are other aerial visitors later in the autumn, cormorants, also passing through on migration. Just south of Haifa, there's a group of islands where they roost during the night, commuting every morning to the same fish ponds favoured by the pelicans. There are 10,000 of them on the coast, and 10,000 more on lakes inland. Like the pelicans, they know exactly where they're going. Most of the adults have been here before. Unlike the pelicans which fish from the surface, the cormorants dive after their prey, flying underwater with their hooked beaks at the ready. They seldom miss a catch. It's understandable that the fish farmers resent them and dread their arrival each autumn. Among the more humane methods of keeping them away is the siren truck, but all this does is to pass the problem on to someone else. Who might try a different solution? If the fish ponds are not too big, it's worth the expense of covering them with nets to keep the birds at bay. Cormorants can eat thousands of dollars worth of fish in a single raid. Cormorants have another resort at Birkat Atta, a group of ponds near the coast that have been proposed as a nature reserve. But if it continues to shelter so many cormorants, the reserve is unlikely to get the fish farmer's vote. The trees near the water are whitewashed and killed by the cormorants' droppings. Next morning they will have to look for another fish pond, too large to net and without a siren truck to drive them away. In the undergrowth beneath the trees, one of the Holy Land's more unholy inhabitants, a huge predatory cricket called Saga, is laying its eggs. It's more than 10 centimetres long, and it preys on other insects, even up to its own size. Not that there are many that big. For all its great size and fierce disposition, it's surprisingly popular in Israel, perhaps because it doesn't actually affect people's lives.
Part of the problem of conservation in Israel is this matter of toleration. Cormorants are destructive and messy and deeply unpopular. Wild boar can also be destructive. They undermine fields and sometimes wreck tractors. Though they're not especially messy, and in some quarters they're quite well liked. Here, the farmer is content for a family of piglets and their parents to share his cattle's feed at night. The only enemy of wild boars is man the hunter. Jews aren't supposed to eat pigs, but there are plenty of Christians and Arabs in the Holy Land who do, along with a number of less religious Jews. In the absence of natural predators, the boars flourish. Indeed, they're encouraged as a wild food source. When the farmer comes round the corner on his tractor, the piglets scamper, but their parents amble quietly away with no sign of panic. They know they have nothing to fear, here at least. Another nocturnal visitor to farmland is a notorious crop raider, and even more efficient at undermining the fields with its burrows. Porcupines spread to Israel from India long ago, and now they're found all over the country. They're not dangerous to humans, though there are some dogs in the Holy Land that regret meeting a porcupine on a dark night. They're just inquisitive and relentless in their search for food. To potato growers, for example, they're unwelcome guests. They're hunted even more enthusiastically than wild boar, simply because the hunters regard them as the most delicious quarry there is. Sadly, this means that near the larger towns they've become rare through overhunting, as well as losing their habitat to building sites and dying on the busy roads. Out here in the country, though, they're still quite common, scavenging round farmyards when the rest of the world is asleep. In springtime, the sea road turns red as a million poppies bloom. A few days later, it's blue, and then a twinkling mosaic of colour and movement. Anemones, tulips, irises, cyclamens, many of the most popular house and garden flowers in the rest of the world grow wild here in the Holy Land. With the flowers come the insects that depend on them, not least moths and butterflies. A cluster of small, hairy caterpillars feeds in the shelter of a web of their own making. They'll grow into a small moth with a large name, Ochnagyna loei. It's insignificant, but responsible for pollinating many of the flowers on the sea road. Flicking their tails from side to side is designed to deter hungry birds, which don't like getting the irritating hairs in their eyes and nostrils. As they grow, the caterpillars share what must be some of the most beautiful food on earth.
A spectacularly colourful caterpillar belongs to the swallowtail butterfly, the Mediterranean variety of the large and decorative insect that's much admired in Europe. It has little to fear from spiders. It's simply too large for them to handle, even when the wind dislodges it from its feeding place directly into a web. The spider might even be quite relieved when its enormous visitor breaks free and falls to the ground. The caterpillar of the monarch butterfly is equally colourful and poisonous as well. Its development into an adult is one of those everyday miracles in which the earthbound becomes airborne. is mainly sedentary, though some migrate from the Dead Sea Valley to breed here on the coast. Monarchs as a species are the best travelled butterflies in the world. They're found all across southern Europe and Asia, as well as the Americas from Mexico to Canada. Their spectacular wing patterns are not only to enable members of the species to recognize each other when they mate, they serve also to warn birds and other potential predators that the butterflies, like the caterpillars, are poisonous. They get the poison from their food plants when they're caterpillars and store it in their bodies. It does them no harm, but it will teach an unforgettable lesson to any animal that tries to eat them. This mating pair is at the northern edge of their range. The race extends far to the south along the Great Rift Valley. Some of the monarchs breeding in Israel may have migrated here from Africa. The swallowtail has also emerged. It's a more sedentary species and will spend the rest of its life here. The butterflies are accepted because of their beauty, but some other animals of the sea road are valued for more practical reasons as well. Lesser kestrels have regained their old breeding territories in spite of the encroachment of hundreds of houses. The people who have invaded the kestrel's home have, without planning it, provided sites that mimic the bird's natural nesting places, holes in cliffs. Instead of trees, electricity cables provide perches for their rough and tumble courtship. The female will only mate when she's been fed by the male. 
He brings her a tribute in the form of a small snake, which she is graciously pleased to accept. When people see kestrels eating snakes, they instantly give the birds their support as allies in the eternal conflict between people and snakes, even though most of them here are harmless. The snakes, that is. Once they've chosen a nesting site, the kestrels set about starting a family. Some new housing developments are occupied by birds almost before the people have moved in. Open ledges on cliffs are the natural home of common kestrels, and here there's a plentiful supply. Many people grow flowers in their window boxes. Here people are happy to grow beautiful birds of prey as well. Meanwhile, the lesser kestrels have set up home in a perfect hole, well sheltered from the weather and from predators. Sad to say, other equally beautiful birds are not treated with the same consideration. In the town park of Pardesh Hanna, cattle egrets had built up a colony in the trees numbering about 15,000 birds. They were so crowded that they were making a mess of the park. The solution decreed by the mayor was simple but brutal. The birds had to go. The work was carried out by the NRA, the Nature Reserves Authority, the official body responsible for everything to do with wildlife. They felt obliged to intervene before local people took the law into their own hands. The idea was that the birds would have time to nest again somewhere else, but in fact they were too late. By the time the first eggs hatch, the egret's breeding period is over. Looked at coolly, there are millions of cattle egrets in the Middle East and many colonies are destroyed each year by natural forces such as storms or fire. The species occurs all over Africa and is even spread by natural means into the United States. But many people found it difficult to look at it coolly. What they saw was the wholesale slaughter of a colony of pretty little herons just to suit the convenience of humans. And they contrasted it with this operation. Here, scientists from the same NRA, together with others from the Society for the Protection of Nature, tenderly remove a baby bird from its egg on the day it was due to hatch. Because it was incubated near sea level and it normally breeds in the highlands where the air is much drier, the egg has retained too much water and needs human help if it's to hatch successfully. The scientists tie off the yolk sac before putting the baby bird into a new shell, an old one really, previously used by an ostrich. They're going to put it under a foster hen, an elderly female, 35 years of age, who can no longer lay fertile eggs, but is still a very good mother. She and the baby chick are griffon vultures. The second-hand shell will convince the foster mother that she hatched the egg herself, and now she will rear the chick as her own. While one of them keeps the old lady at bay, the other scientist puts the egg into her nest. The vulture chick has been selected not for its beauty, but for the part it will play in the plans to restore Israel's northern forests to their original condition. 
its foster mother takes to it at once. Some birds win, others lose in their contacts with humans along the sea road. The beaches that are so popular with holidaymakers were once the breeding grounds of common terns, among other seabirds. Today, the terns have to find somewhere else to carry on their courtship. Their space has been taken over by other courting couples. They now perform their intricate countermarches on the shores of an island near the coast that has been set aside for their use. It's much smaller than their old range, but at least they're safe and undisturbed. As their name suggests, common terns are very numerous on a world scale. They breed from here all the way into northern Europe, where they overlap with their close relative, the Arctic tern. The eastern Mediterranean is close to the southern limit of their range. The island where they breed is only about 300 meters from the shore, but it offers seclusion and the right kind of habitat for nesting. In the noise and bustle of the breeding colony, the human sounds from the beach opposite can hardly be heard. In the hot sunshine, the parents need to shade the chick rather than keep it warm. and feed it, of course. There are still plenty of small fish, even in these crowded waters. It's the supply of suitable fish for human consumption that's becoming limited. But still the trawlers go out in the hope of striking lucky. Although pollution is something of a problem, as it is off most populated shores, another factor is becoming more important. Since the Aswan Dam was built, the flow of nutrients from the Nile Valley has been cut almost to nothing. Building marinas and harbours along the coast has had the same effect, so that these waters are becoming short of food for fish. But this net feels satisfactorily heavy. A tern flying home with food for its chick might not want a share of what the net contains. Since the opening of the Suez Canal, scientists have noticed the phenomenon of Lissepsian migration, named after the architect of the canal. This is one of its effects. Swarms of jellyfish from the Red Sea came through the canal to the eastern Mediterranean in the 1970s and found it very much to their taste. With them came about 40 species of fish, some of them from the Indian Ocean, of which about 10 are edible. They all compete all too successfully with the local fishes. The jellyfish can make bathing a horrific experience on days when they come ashore in numbers. People are understandably less than enthusiastic about sharing the water with companions like this, wherever they came from. But they share the water and the beach with another form of marine life without knowing anything about it. Marks like tractor tires leading up the beach were made last night by a nesting hawksbill turtle. Turtles hide their nests well. The couple on the beach are unaware that it's right underneath them.
By probing gently with a light stick, the NRA biologists locate the eggs, 30 centimeters under the sand. The average clutch laid by a hawksbill turtle is between 70 and 90 eggs. The hawksbill is endangered all round the Mediterranean. They plan to increase its chances by protecting the eggs until they hatch. It's vital not to turn the eggs over while handling them. Unlike birds' eggs, they're not designed to be rolled. When all the eggs have been collected, they'll be reburied further up the beach and fenced off to protect them against dogs, mongooses and other likely egg thieves. They'll hatch in just 57 days from now. Israel is at the crossroads of three separate biological regions, not just European and African, but Asian too. One of the new arrivals from Asia is not welcomed by farmers who grow sunflower seeds as a crop. It's the ring-necked parakeet. Some people say that they're all descended from escaped cage birds, while others think that it's a natural expansion from the parakeet's home range in Iran. Whatever the truth, since the late 80s they have bred very successfully in Israel, becoming an agricultural pest, especially of sunflowers. They're engaging little birds, moving around in noisy flocks, glinting green in the sun. It's only their appetites that upset the farmers. A good-sized flock can destroy a crop in one visit. Meanwhile, the appetite of the kestrels' chicks continues to increase. Everything their parents can catch, from crickets and lizards to small birds and rodents, is welcome to the hungry brood. The male feeds them with a shrew, while the female seems upset that her offering of a cricket is ignored. In the new housing development, the common kestrels too are doing well under the fond gaze of their human neighbours. It's best to leave the feeding of these three chicks to the experts. Watching the kestrels gave rise to the idea that they might make themselves useful as well as merely decorative. Some farmers, to avoid using chemicals to control pests, especially rodents, tried putting up nest sites for kestrels around their crop fields and orchards. Among the mango trees, the simple boxes were an immediate success. With four voracious mouths to feed, this mother has to hunt from dawn to dusk. Already the chick with the vole to eat is masking it from its nestmates with its wings, in the typical gesture of birds of prey known as mantling. Where kestrels led, barn owls soon followed as the farmer's allies. They could take over the night shift while the kestrels were asleep.
To maintain barn owls, farmland has to be relatively free from pesticides. Many advanced agricultural countries have all but lost their barn owls through ill-advised poisoning of the very pests that the owls feed on. They are very enthusiastic hunters. A pair with young will hunt all night even after the chicks are full to bursting, having a marked effect on the numbers of the small mammals that are their main prey. The nest boxes don't need to be elaborate. A partition inside helps to keep mischief makers out during the day, though the parents are quite capable of keeping crows or jays away while they guard the eggs. And a perch in front gives the returning adults somewhere to land. It's one of the wonders of nature that such beautiful birds can grow from such ugly chicks. It's now exactly 57 days since the hawksbill turtle buried her eggs on the beach. They will hatch tonight under the full moon. Just five centimeters long, the baby turtles emerge from the sand right on cue. They head instinctively down the beach towards the brightest part of the horizon, which is the moonlit sea. Their guardians have opened the canvas fence that has protected the eggs for the last two months. They watch their charges on their way and wish them Godspeed through a dangerous childhood. If they escape the attentions of sharks and seabirds, one or two from this clutch just might return to this very beach in years to come, to leave the tractor tracks that will enable their eggs to be found and protected in their turn. Tracks are a vital part of understanding what goes on when there's no one to watch. Field studies like this are designed to give people from the cities a feel for the wilder side of their country. Reading the results an hour or two later shows that a snake passed this way and a small rodent, perhaps a gerbil. It's reasonable to assume that they weren't here at the same time. The instructor aims to pass on his own fascination with the life of the dunes. Small mammal traps add to the interest, providing living evidence to support the clues in the sand. And here is the gerbil, nervous but safe. The trap might have been its refuge from the snake. The sand on these dunes came originally from the Nile Delta, deposited on the coast by currents from the south. The Aswan Dam has reduced the supply almost to nothing, as well as starving the sea, it's withholding the building blocks of the shore. All the more reason to think twice before using the sand to build houses. Meanwhile, a rebuilding operation is underway at Mount Carmel. The fallow deer are ready to be released into a large protected compound in the forest, 
as a preliminary to being given complete freedom. First, they must be darted with a muscle relaxant. Some of them are fitted with radio collars like the Rodeo so that their progress can be followed. Blindfolded and drowsy, they're lifted gently into the truck that will take them to their new home. Their destination is that part of the sea road that once lay under the protection of the fortress of Montfort, built by the Crusaders around 800 years ago. Because of the absence of browsing animals, the forest here has become too dense to be used by the multitude of birds and small mammals that should be here. The fallow deer will clear the undergrowth and open up the forest floor. Clearings caused by natural fires quickly become overgrown, not with trees but with impenetrable scrub. The deer will slow this regrowth, allowing the trees to return. In one recent clearing, there's one of the rarest animals in Israel. It's a salamander, one of only six species of amphibian in the whole country. Although it's relatively common in central and southern Europe, this is the southernmost extent of its range. The arrival of the truck puts it into what, among salamanders, counts as a panic. The deer have been examined by the vet and found to be in good health, fit for release. The antidote to the muscle relaxing drug takes only 20 seconds to work, leaving them fully alert from the moment they leave the truck. The salamander contemplates his new neighbours with interest as they trot past his pool. and finally decides to make a slow run for it. Mediterranean fallow deer are in great demand in Australia and New Zealand to be crossbred in captivity with European fallow deer. The reason for this is a little bizarre. The hybrid males grow particularly abundant velvet on each season's new antlers, and the velvet is much sought after for use in traditional medicine in the Far East. In spite of generous offers from Australasia, these deer will live and die in freedom under the watchful eyes of the NRA. In fact, after what should be a long and fruitful life, opening up the forest and rearing many calves, Dying is part of their role in the rebuilding of the forest ecosystem. It's not only predators and browsing animals that are missing from these hills, but also scavengers. For nearly a hundred years there has been nothing for them to scavenge. Now that there are deer once more in the forest, it's time to replace the scavengers. The vulture chick that was hatched, as it were, by caesarean section and fostered by the venerable old lady has grown into a healthy young bird. It's his turn to taste freedom, together with others of his captive bred generation. He seems uncertain. The cage is where food has always been, and the world outside is very large.
After only a few minutes' practice, he's soaring over the forest, back in his rightful home. After so many centuries of human domination, the north of the Holy Land and the sea road along the coast are gradually being returned to a more natural condition. It will be an uphill task, especially where human needs conflict with those of the wildlife, but the will and the means are there to succeed. To those who know only Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, these northern forests come as a surprise. To the south lies the Jordan Valley, and south of that again the Dead Sea and the huge southern deserts, also full of surprises, but then that's the nature of the Holy Land. <laughs>